go to securefreedomradio.org today. It's your freedom. It's your country. Frank Gaffney's Secure Freedom Radio. We're back and joined by another of my all-time favorite people, Claudia Rosette, the journalist in residence at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington. She is also a columnist with Forbes.com and PJ Media. But she's also brings to uh, this portfolio of international affairs, national security, foreign policy and the like, uh, an extraordinary background as an investigative reporter and editorialist for the Wall Street Journal, among other publications. Claudia, it is a delight to have you with us, especially as you have uh, been deep soaking, marinating, if you will, in in the spectacle of the United Nations the past uh, 10 days or so. Talk a little bit about the parade of dictators that we've seen uh, traipsing through those quarters and what we heard from them. Yes, sure. Good morning, Frank. The parade of dictators began on Monday with the opening of the UN general debate. First, we had the head of a democratic country, the United States. I'm mean, talking about the starring lineup here, President Obama, who the U.S. traditionally has one of the earliest speaking slots in this sort of six days, as it's playing out right now, of speeches from every member of the U.N. and then some begins. And then uh, also on Monday came this parade of dictators who what they have in common is that President Obama has really gone far during his term as president, to enable and empower and encourage them. And what was this lineup? China, with its president fresh from a state dinner at the White House. Russia, President Putin, who two days later gave the U.S. one hour's notice that (laughs) that he was about to start bombing the positions of U.S.-backed rebels in Syria. Iran, whose president had, of course, in his pocket the... uh, Sealed, the U.N. sealed Iran nuclear deal, which effectively outlines Iran's path to the bomb, whether they choose to cheat or just wait until it sunsets. And then Cuba, uh, whose president, Raul Castro, came after President Obama announced last December that he had decided it was time to normalize relations with Cuba and having obtained virtually nothing in the way of concessions for this has uh, sent Secretary of State John Kerry over to Havana, sort of in the middle of busy, <laughs> as the Iran nuclear talks were being debated here, sorry, the, the Iran nuclear agreement that was being debated here, Secretary of State Kerry was rushing over to Havana to raise the U.S. flag. So that was the starring lineup. Now it's been followed by a great many more. Robert, Robert uh, Mugabe of Zimbabwe was later that day. Uh, we've just, and so on. But it has been this parade, Frank, at an institution where more than half the 193 member states are not free. You know, and it, what makes this all the more astonishing, Claudia Rosette, and again, nobody really understands the workings of this institution and its and its malevolence really better than you, but... Here we have the UN fomenting and yet another radical leftist program in the form now of these uh, so-called sustainability goals. And I think most Americans have no idea of either the nature of the organization. I think they don't like it very much, but they don't really understand it as you do, needless to say. But the kind of implications agendas like this one can have. Talk a little bit about what's up with all of that. Yeah, when you get to the bottom of all the polysyllabic words with which the UN festoons these plans, what we're basically talking about is uh, global central planning. That's what's envisioned here. And, you know, central planning has really never worked out well. One of the morals of the 20th century was don't try it. It both beggars people, it leads to destitution, and it leads to bloody, horrible doings because the force required to try to make it work ends up requiring that people die because the government wants them to do things that they're not otherwise inclined to do. And that's one of the big agendas here. Now, this is something where when the U.S. buys into it, it becomes very dangerous, in part because the details become so complex and really boring that people don't follow it, you know, and, and yet great damage can be done from this. But also because when you get countries such as Russia or China saying, oh, you know, we back this, 
they're basically dictatorships. They're run by rulers, governments that can easily decide not to observe deals that they sign on to at the UN. And routinely Whereas do. the U.S. is much more constrained to do so. We have we're a country of laws. We're an open society, so people come and say, wait a minute, if we gave our word, it's very easy to see. You know, right now, the world is pouring over Hillary Clinton's emails as they're being divulged by the State Department. You really don't see that happening in a place like China or Russia. Okay. Needless to say, where presumably those uh, unredacted <laughs> emails actually reside, I, I think it almost certainly actually is going to beggar a lot of people, and and for that matter, probably wind up with a lot of them being dead, as as I fear will this uh, energy agenda of President Obama, which kind of fits into this uh, this program, and of course the one he intends to sign, evidently without Senate advice and consent, in Paris in a couple of months' time. This uh, global energy. Accord. What are your thoughts on that, Claudia? We should be extremely worried about that, that that is potentially an enormous cost. And as we were just saying, when the U.S. signs on to this kind of a deal, it's under enormous pressure to actually try and live up to it. We try to keep our word. When China says, as the president of China did recently when he was in Washington, oh, you know, well, we're going to do things like curb our carbon emissions. Now, first of all, the science behind this is not at all established. Actually, we, nobody knows precisely what really works here. And I would also suggest that the whole business of climate change, which used to be, let's see, the UN was first concerned about global cooling and then about global warming and then about any change in climate at all. And effectively, Frank, it's again, it boils down to what? They want to fine tune the economy of the planet in order to try and to fine tune the climate. Again, it gets back to central planning. Frank, mankind is adapted to changes in climate through things like the invention of clothing, heating, homes, houses. Okay, Fire. climate has been changing <laughs> since forever. And now, this is, I suspect that in centuries to come, assuming there's still population on this planet, People will look back there and say, wow, that was medieval superstition. Yeah, but in the name was. of this, we're, we're now about to see a big push by the administration. And President Obama may just try to override the normal processes as he, in this country as he has done in so many cases by now. No, notably with Iran most recently, of course. Correct. Where the Senate didn't even end, end up with a vote. And... It could, Frank, it could be so costly. What it does is get in the way of the economic adaptation that capitalism would otherwise provide to anything that comes along with the climate. In other words, it's so backwards. It is indeed it's upside down. It's a terrible, down. needless cost. And that's what, that's what looms in Paris. Claudia, very quickly, lastly, we had uh, earlier this week the International Atomic Energy Agency accepting the results of, uh, or, the, or the samples, I should say, that uh, Iran provided for the Parchin facility. Is it wise for us to be reposing in this entity the responsibility of, of verifying this very bad deal with Iran. No, it's terrible. And one of the requirements of any Iran nuclear deal should have been that no matter what the UN conventions, that uh, Iran disclose things directly in such a way that the U.S. has complete, transparent, immediate access. The IAEA is a UN creature, and recall that for years under the its Egyptian head, Mohammed al baradei it sat on evidence about Iran. And there's every reason and actually to mis it misrepresented again. them. Yeah, and it does seem that uh, new management, which started out rather robust, has uh, has gone the way of El Baradai. Claudia, this is a subject for a longer conversation. Uh, we look forward to having it with you soon. In the meantime, keep up the terrific work you do at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies at Forbes and, of course, at PJ Media. Come back to us again soon. I hope the rest of you will come back to us again tomorrow, same time, same station. Until then, this is Frank Gaffney. Thanks for listening. From the nation's capital, you've been listening to Secure Freedom Radio with Frank Gaffney. 